The Andy Poland Show. We got to go after this with everything we got, thinking they're going to come with everything they got. I'll start off by saying I'm bored, I'm broke, and I'm back. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630 starts right now. We said the NCAA tournament was more unpredictable than ever. Gosh, with the transfer portal, you don't know who's where and what teams are good and any team can be. Well, here we are heading into the Sweet 16. And it's very, very chalky. We got all four number ones still alive. All four number twos. Two number threes and two number fours still in it. The only double-digit seed still alive is North Carolina State. And if you want to call them a Cinderella, you can. But they're coming out of the ACC, which is 8-1. and one in this tournament with only Virginia embarrassing itself in the play-in game. Otherwise, the conference has been strong, and they're riding the momentum of winning the ACC championship in which they beat a number one seed in this tournament in North Carolina. And look, NC State has won two national titles. This is not a Cinderella program. And the last time that they won the national title, it's a long time ago, it's 41 years ago, but they went in only because they won the ACC tournament. There was only 48 teams then, and they would not have been in the field as an at-large had they not won the ACC tournament, but they got an automatic spot because of that and survived in advance with Jimmy V and then pulling off what could be the biggest upset in the history of the tournament where they beat Houston for the national championship in 1983. But as you look at the field and what's left, um, yeah, it's all – not only are they top seeds, but outside of San Diego State, which is new money, having made the Final Four and, for that matter, the championship game last year, they're mostly traditional basketball powers. Um, and even some of the more newer powers, like Houston, has made its way back to being a power with Kelvin Sampson in recent days. Uh, Marquette, uh, that's a program that did win a national championship in 1977. And Shaka Smart's a hell of a coach. He got to the Final Four with VCU. Um, it was 10, 11 years ago now. Whew, time is flying by. Um, Purdue, the big choker, but they looked awesome in just clobbering Utah State yesterday, 106-67. And it really, <clears throat> excuse me, wasn't even that close. Zach Eady, unstoppable in the middle. Uh, Gonzaga, they're not even new money anymore. They're like an old power. It's a small school, but they've established themselves as a basketball powerhouse. They've been to Final Fours. They've been to the championship game, haven't won it all. I don't know whether they can win it all this year. I don't like their chances against Purdue in the next round. But, you know, you look at this Creighton. Okay, Creighton maybe, uh, maybe not considered to be a huge program, but they're coming out of the Big East where they've been a really good team in recent years. Tennessee, I mean, these are all – You know, these are all teams that we're used to seeing this deep in the NCAA tournament. And if you want to get all worked up about NC State being a Cinderella, you can. But the reality is it's uh, it's pretty pretty much chalk. And we went into the weekend. Well, Thursday, when the tournament started, we went into it thinking that UConn was the prohibitive favorite and they haven't done anything so far that wouldn't lead you to believe that they took care of Stetson, obviously, easily in the first round they won that by 39 points and yesterday they jumped out to a huge lead against Northwestern and cruised to a 75 to 58 victory so uh you know I I, it's a rematch of last year's championship I would think that they would maybe have a close game with San Diego State they win that and then to get to the final four you're looking at a matchup against Illinois or Iowa State two teams that uh, I think they could easily beat so but yet it can almost pencil in Connecticut back into another Final Four, and they would be the favorite to win it all. Um, North Carolina has not had a struggle yet. Uh, they beat Wagner easily in the first round, 90-62, to 62, and uh, really didn't have any trouble with Michigan State. That's another power. That's another legendary coach in Tom Izzo. They win that game 85-69. to 69. Um, There really hasn't been any buzzer beaters other than what we had late last night with Texas A&M taking Houston to overtime. But Houston won that game 195. And when you look at the history of this tournament, you usually have a game like that along the way. Uh, The team that wins it all sometimes gets a scare. And I think more often than not, at least as a game where it's it's really, really close and it's a nail biter. And they had that last night. Maybe they get that out of the way and maybe they take care of Duke easily 
in the next round. Um, Duke is taking care of business, though. Vermont gave him a pretty good game. Um, the 64-47 final really doesn't tell the story of that game. But uh, yesterday's win over JMU, which was really like everybody's favorite um, to win the 12-5. You always got to pick a 12-5. And if you're picking one, most people were picking James Madison to beat Wisconsin, which they did. They beat him by 11 points. But whew, they were totally overmatched by Duke last night. Um, and so here we are, um, and you wonder, you know, what the story of the tournament is so far. I still think it's Oakland, um, not just because they won their first round game over Kentucky, and they won that game eighty to seventy six as a fourteen seed. That's the biggest upset so far. Fourteen beating a three. Uh, we also had Yale as a thirteen beating Auburn seventy eight to seventy six, but uh, Yale went out uh, meekly last night to San Diego State, 85-57. So uh, I don't know how much of a Cinderella story they were. Um, Grand Canyon, Grand Canyon beating St. Mary's. That was somewhat surprising. But, you know, St. Mary's is from the Western Conference, Western Athletic Conference, or what used to be that. um, And they beat Gonzaga in the final of their uh, conference tournament. But um, not too many people follow St. Mary's very closely. Grand Canyon wins that, and they gave Alabama a great game yesterday. That, in fact, that's one of the greatest college basketball games I've seen in recent years. Uh, the final score, you know, isn't isn't really uh, close. It's 72-61, but Alabama put it away late. Grand Canyon, they went toe-to-toe, and it was physical. It was fast. Referees let them play. It was a very entertaining game to watch. And uh, Grand Canyon, which now has had its first win ever in the tournament over St. Mary's, they can walk out pretty proud, uh, having played a really good game against Alabama. Uh, Duquesne beating BYU, 11 over a 6, pretty big deal. Uh, And Duquesne won its first ever NCAA tournament game. But uh, when it came time to play one of the big boys, Illinois, it uh, it really wasn't much of a game as Illinois won 89 to 63. Uh, NC State beating Texas Tech in the first round. And then really, that is, I guess, the only upset of the second round, uh, beating Oregon. Uh, but, uh, I mean, no, it's not an upset because they beat Oakland. That's right. So that's, that's not an upset. In fact, the only upset I found for the second round, and this is, you know, I don't even think it's that big of a deal because it's Clemson out of the ACC. But Clemson beating Baylor 72-64 yesterday. And Baylor missed 10 free throws in this game. And three of them were front ends of one and one So if they had done a better job hitting free throws, Baylor could have won that game. They were behind big at times. They came back. They cut it down. I think they got it to one. And, uh, and then Clemson was able to pull away for the win. But that's really the only second-round uh, upset that we had. So we had a total... I counted two, four, six, eight in the first round. Uh, Oakland over Kentucky, JMU over Wisconsin, Grand Canyon over St. Mary's, Yale over Auburn, Duquesne over BYU, NC State beating Texas Tech, Oregon over South Carolina. That's an 11-6. I don't know how much you get excited about that. And I think Oregon probably was underseeded there. And then uh, Colorado beating Florida, 102 to 100. That's a 10 beating a 7. Again, not that big a deal. So out of the weekend – with all that happened, all the games that were played, leaving us from a, a tournament that started last Tuesday with 68 teams down to 16, the story is Oakland. Oakland is the number one story of this tournament so far. And most people thinking, oh, Oakland, where's the – I'm, I'm pretty familiar with California. Where's that school located? No, it's, it's about uh, 45 minutes north of Detroit. It's in Michigan. They've been in the tournament before. Uh, hadn't won until they knocked off Kentucky – and became the story. And, and Jack Gelke was fabulous. I mean, he was he was he had 10 threes in the win over Kentucky. Uh, he had been playing Division II basketball for five years. Really hadn't created a lot of attention. Wasn't like, you know, one of these great Division II shooters who you got to give a shot to. He got to Oakland, had one more year of eligibility, and was tremendous. And he gave people excitement about a guy who you're never going to see in the NBA. He'll never get a sniff at the league. But for one shining moment, he had his one shining moment, and that's why this tournament is what it is. And this is his coach, Greg Campy, who's also a great story in himself. He went to Bowling Green. He was a point guard there, uh, also was the punter on the football team, goes to, I forget the school he went to as an assistant for a few years, but 40 years ago. So he's a young guy, 68 
28 years old. He takes over a Division II program at, at Oakland and stays, stays for 40 years, gets them into Division I. They're competitive. They make the tournament a few times. And then he's got his moment in the spotlight along with his player, Jack Gelke, who's, you know, a similar story. Living under the radar for most of his college career, has this unbelievable coming out party against Kentucky. Even gets an NIL deal. They, they shot a commercial with him uh, sometime during the day, I guess on Friday. <laughs> and then he comes out on Saturday and and played well, uh, but they couldn't quite get it done. And and really, it was a it was a terrific game that they played against NC State. I mean, it came down to to really the last possession. NC State won by six, but it was it was down to the wire there. And uh, and and the fact that uh, they were able to take them to overtime was a big deal too. So uh, this was this was the coach Greg Campy talking to the media after. Uh, after his shining moment comes to an end. It's hard because it's over, right? And it's going to end this way for every team but one in this tournament. The hard part for me is I've done this a long time, and I'm going to tell you, I, in this day and age of kids leaving and the lack of respect for authority and the, you know, What about me? What can I make? And all the people telling everybody that's how you should be. You know, the way we're going. To have a team like I had, 15 guys that just cared about each other, 15 guys that just cared about the outcome of the team and the pride they had to be part of a team and the way they joked and hung around and you know, every game all through the year, somebody else, somebody else, it was, you know, nobody cared who it was. They just were glad that we were together. When things went bad, we picked each other up, and then we won games, and we won games, and close games after close games, I guess it ends with a close loss. But um, it, it was just a joy in this day and age to walk into the office every day and know that I'm lucky I get to go in that gym and be with this, this group of kids. And that's probably what hurts the most right now is I know that that's over. And, uh, man, I'm going to miss that. Money is nice. And who wouldn't want to be making $8.5 million a year like John Calipari? But what Greg Campy is doing for about $320,000 a year with a budget of a, that's a tenth of Kentucky's basketball budget, it's $2.3 million. Kentucky has a $23 million budget. But the core and the roots of the game – or what he's able to experience, and he's got something unique going on there. Um, and I'm sure he's comfortable with what he makes. Is he wealthy? Does he have a yacht? Does he have a beach house? I don't know. But he's he's got something there that he obviously loves, and at 68 is continuing to do. doesn't sound like he's ready to, to go anywhere. Uh, coming back next year, trying to do this again. And also, you know, gave us a glimpse of with all that's going on in college basketball right now where, you know, players come in and the only thing they want to know is how much they're going to get paid and, and the NIL and, and guys extending, you know, five and six years and, and making commercials. He's got what is, has, has made this tournament what it is. And, and without the story of Oakland, it's just another basketball tournament with – Really good teams, you know, blue blood programs, North Carolina and Purdue and, uh, you know, and, and Duke and those teams. Those those are the teams that we see every year. But when teams like Oakland come around and they don't come around every year, not not every year. And, and this in this case, he's, this is not going to be a sweet 16, darling. This is a, a story that ended on Saturday night, but it ended with people looking at a program that is, you know, kind of quaint, kind of fun, and uh, and has really helped to make the NCAA tournament as popular as it is. I think we're good for college basketball. I think I think we really were. I think I think there's 360 some Division One coaches. That's all the jobs there are in the country. And I would say a lot of those guys are envious, not of Oakland or not of what we do or not of me, but of our team, and not the winning or losing but having that as a team because what I talked about is in this day is really unusual. And so I think that we probably, that was reflected. And I mean, I don't think you can play harder than we play. I really don't. 
there were more floor burns, more dives on the floor, more. I don't think, you know, I think we played pretty smart too. And you know, Dean Smith, who most people today, you know, he's fading away into people's memories. But Dean Smith, you know, for all the coaches in the world that read his books and know who he is, he had a, mon a mantra of play hard, play smart, and play as one. And I think we epitomize that. I really do. And I think that's probably why. And then, obviously, when you got a guy that's going to be a, a insurance salesman scoring 60 points in two games and killing it, I mean, when he... I don't know if I've ever seen, I know in my life, I've never put a sub in the game and saw a place go nuts with, you know, three minutes into a game with, you know, what does this place seat? 18,000 or whatever it seats, I don't know. But that's the large, that was the largest, loud, loudest roar of the night when he went in three minutes into the game and then he caught it and made it. And it was electric and, I mean, the legend of Jack Golke is gonna, <laughs> it's gonna go on and Oakland's gonna be associated with that. And then you saw Trey Townsend is, I mean, Trey Townsend's a pro. He's a pro. He proved it tonight. You know, everybody says, well, isn't he a little undersized? And he went out and made threes tonight. He, did, he does what he has to do. We could have shot a lot of threes all year, but he, nobody could guard him in there at our, at our level. I think he got fouled a lot tonight. You know, I think he got fouled a lot tonight. How many free throws did he shoot? Eight. Oh, I, if... And if that was in our league and that happened, he would have shot 20 tonight because that's the only way to stop him is to, you know, to knock him to the ground. And that, so is what it is. But I hope that's what they saw. Yeah, we saw a great thing. And uh, hope you see you back next year. That was fun to, uh, to watch, uh, watch him coach his team in the tournament. So what we got left is uh, four from the ACC. All three Big East teams move on. Big East goes 6-0 and over the weekend. Big 12 has only two left. Big 10 has two left. SEC, only two left. Alabama and Tennessee uh, still alive, and the Pac-12 has one. Uh, and uh, there's reason to believe that Biggie should have had more. They had three teams that won 20 games, and uh, even Bob Hur – not Bob Hurley, Danny Hurley, coach of uh, Connecticut, uh, said this, Seton Hall, St. John's, and Providence, all 20-win teams. Probably St. John's should have been in. Virginia clearly should have been out. And Hurley said, obviously, the mistake was made. Um, he said uh, he said all their games were won by double digits in the league, uh, and he said it sucks. And he said he's been on a, a text chain with uh, Shaka Smart and Greg McDermott, coach of Creighton, got a group chat going, some other coaches in the league, Kim English of Providence, Seton Hall coach Shaheen Holloway, um, and we chat with the coaches. He says, I know everybody is fired up to see us continue to push and rep the league at a high level. I know uh, we're excited. And uh, Val Ackerman, by the way, is the commissioner of the Big East. She used to run the uh, WNBA. So uh, we'll probably see Connecticut in the Final Four. The way it's looking, they're going to repeat as national champions. And, you know, maybe the league got dragged down by teams like Georgetown and DePaul. But in retrospect, yeah, the Big East should have had more than three. And those teams are 3-0. and It's the only undefeated conference among those that got in. All right, coming up in the next hour, Kim Mulkey wigs out about a story that isn't yet in the Washington Post, may be in the Washington Post, and says she's ready to sue even though a word of it hasn't been published, printed, whatever we call it these days. We'll uh, hear her rant coming up and much more as we continue. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. She doth protest too much. This is funny, and we're going to get to this very shortly, Kim Bulkey, who is the coach of LSU, women's basketball team. They won the national championship last year, beat Caitlin Clark in Iowa in the final. And there's a story that's in the works, been confirmed by Ken Babb of The Post uh, about her. We don't know anything about the story, but apparently she's heard enough that she doesn't like what's about to be printed, if it, if it in fact comes out. So she went on a long rant before their game last night, which they won easily. But it was all about how she was going to sue the Washington Post if they published this hit piece about her. And one of the really funny things that she said unintentionally was that the reporter's been trying to talk to her for two years. And just before they're about to leave for the NCAA tournament, he's got 12 questions he wants her to answer. It's just, she, he hits us now at this time? We, we didn't have time for this? 
Yeah, she's been trying to get you for two years. Uh, obviously, he had some questions that she didn't want to answer. So she's gone on the offensive before there's even a piece out that she could defend herself about. So uh, we'll get to that in uh, in just a moment. Um, first, I want to talk a little bit about the gambling issue that's going on throughout sports. And we're supposed to find out today more about the Shohei Otani case. It's uh, It's been very curious so far. But Otani is due to speak to the media this afternoon, I assume with a new interpreter because they just fired the old one after he changed his story. And there's some reporting that was done in the Post uh, by Chelsea James over the weekend uh, about what's happening here. It doesn't sound good. Uh, This is the first information that I've seen about the bookie. Now, you know in 38 states that they have legal sports gambling. California where Otani has played his whole career and is going to continue his career with the Dodgers, doesn't have legalized gambling. But what happened, according to the interpreter, is he rang up a $4 million debt with a bookie. And first he said, first the interpreter said, oh, yeah, um, Shohei paid off the debt. And then he changed it to, oh, no, it, it must have been stolen. There's a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, but uh, this is what uh, was reported. Oh, it was not Chelsea James who reported this. It's Gus Garcia Roberts and Albert Samaha. So they're probably working behind the scenes on this. Um, but uh, the the uh, better is 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 connected somehow to Otani. Uh, you can't bet on baseball. That's the golden rule. We know that from Pete Rose. According to the L.A. Times, which broke this story. There's no indication that Otani uh, or his interpreter bet on baseball, that it was bet on other sports. But the relationship between Otani and the, uh, and the and now fired interpreter is curious. It goes back to 2013 when Otani was playing professional baseball in Japan, and uh, his name is uh, Ipe Muzuhara. He came over as an interpreter for a Red Sox player, um, and they, they've known each other, what, for, for 11 years. Then when Otani signed with the Angels, Muzahara came along as his personal interpreter. They became very, very good friends, according to reports. And during the 2021-22 lockout, uh, Major League employees were barred from communicating with players. Muzahara quit the team so he could remain in contact with Otani and then uh, was rehired after the owners lifted the lockout. Uh, he served as his catcher during home run derby, uh, picked up groceries for him when he was recovering from injuries a couple of years. Okay, that's what friends do. Uh, when Otani left for the Dodgers in free agency, Musahara went with him, but not before reaching out to the Angel fans. Cannot thank you guys enough for all the support the last six years. Really going to miss you guys, and I truly mean that from the bottom of my heart, he wrote on Instagram. Great pleasure being part of the Angels family. Okay, that was a nice little gesture. Um, but the media guide, which which uh, listed Muzahara in it, uh, said that he graduated from the University of California, Riverside in 2007, but the school told NBC Los Angeles it had no record of his attendance. It's unclear. He could have been under another name, they say. Uh, Red Sox have also denied that Muzahara worked for the team as a translator for another player, which had long been reported and was listed on the bio. Several news outlets reported that Muzahara was supposed to serve as a translator for a Yankees player in 2012, but the pitcher failed his physical. So there's there's a lot of holes in this. And then the story of the uh, of the uh, of the of the bookie in this. And uh, the, the question is, you know, who is this guy and what has been going on now? He's 48 years old. Uh, his name is Bauer, B-O-W-Y-E-R. I believe it's pronounced uh, Bauer. And um, uh, they, they found um, some years ago that a couple of packages were sent to him full of cash, like hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash. So that's a, that's a red flag. His name is Matthew Boyer, and, uh, and it, it's, it's now been, you know, examined and re-examined and will continue to be examined. Baseball said that they were launching an investigation on Friday, kind of a news dump, a Friday afternoon thing. We'll see where that goes. Um, Boyer uh, is a a suspected bookie under federal investigation. In an interview, his attorney, Diane Bass, acknowledged that Boyer was a bookie. She reiterated that it was the interpreter, not Otani, who placed the bets, despite the ball player's name appearing on bank records. Uh, she said that Bauer did not have athlete clients that she was aware of. Again, not aware of, but you know, names names on the uh, on the records 
That's not good. Muzahara told ESPN that his losses were at least $4.5 million, but the attorney would not confirm that amount. She said his proximity to Otani is what made Bauer willing to keep floating Muzahara the debts as it reached millions because he was his best friend. Well, that's probably just on his word. I would, I, would you extend that much credit to a, to a guy who's interpreter? You know, do you know the relationship between the two of them? That's where it becomes very curious. Uh, the criminal investigation of Boyer is a byproduct of metastasizing federal, a metastasizing federal probe into illegal betting. Former Dodger star Yasuo Puig is awaiting trial for allegedly lying to federal agents about being a client of an illegal betting ring whose agents included a youth baseball coach who ran the Dodgers training academy in Hawaii. The Post reported last year that Maverick Carter, LeBron James, manager also admitted to placing bets on the NBA with the same illegal operation. Carter was not a target of the probe, not charged. Um, and this guy Bauer, for here's, you know, if, if, it's a, if this is what they know about him so far, he's a failed exterminator, not exterminator of people, but bugs. Uh, and uh, the company uh, went under bankruptcy records. He had more than $2 million in liabilities and uh, claimed $500,000 in personal loans to three individuals. Boyer was in the midst of a year-long battle with Vegas casinos, the bankruptcy records interview show. He's listed among his assets possible legal actions against two resorts, the Cosmopolitan and Aria, that cleaned him out. Instead, uh, they sued him, looking for $250,000. So there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on here, and whether he's going to be able to sort that out today, uh, we don't know. But... This is something that baseball needs to get its arms around because if you got a gambling scandal, scandal surrounding the player in baseball, Shohei Atani, who boy, you got a problem there. Uh, and then you have this, and this is this is more collateral damage of of the way leagues get in bed with gambling. And you know when we had the the CCNY scandals back in the early fifties. And we had some more uh, point-shaving scandals over the years, places like Boston College. And they said, college basketball is a dangerous place. Well, now, you know, gambit, bet bet this, bet that. Everybody's, everybody's involved with betting and college sports, including the tournament. And it's not just the office pool anymore. It's the amount of money. And they use ESPN has its own site called ESPN Bet. And Reese Davis was talking to the ESPN Bet analyst, Aaron Dolan about this matchup that took place between UConn and uh, and Northwestern and I don't know what the spread was but UConn won this game 75 to 58 but the important number was the over under on Northwestern and it was 60 and a half Northwestern scored 58 so it was pretty close but this was before the game Reese Davis talking to Aaron Dolan. So for Northwestern, for example, they just put up 77 points on Florida Atlantic, but you have to remember, 19 of those points, they came in overtime. So I expect this to be a slow game all around, good defenses on both sides of the ball. And so if you look at a team total, although it seems low at 60 and a half, I'm going to go under there. You know what? Some would call this wagering, gambling. I think the way you sold this. No, I I think (laughs) what it is is risk-free investment. That's the way to look at it. A positive positive way. He's calling it risk-free investment. If Northwestern scored three more points and you invested, and I got that in air quotes, you invested $10,000, you wouldn't have $10,000 anymore. That's a risk. So there's a lot of pushback on social media about that. So Reese Davis went on Twitter and he said, obviously there are risks, though I'm not a gambler. I strongly encourage those who do partake, do so with prudence, care, caution, fiscal and personal responsibility and never overextend. Well, when you use a term like risk free investment and people people watch you and you're closely associated with college sports, you the college football show and the college basketball show. You got to look at that as a third rail. You got to stay away from that. You got to put that all on Aaron Dolan. You can't do that. And so maybe he learned a lesson there. But these these are the things that that everybody is going through right now. And it used to be, boy, you put gambling and sports together. You went and people went crazy. Like like Tony Romo wanted to do a fantasy football convention in Vegas, and the NFL said, no, 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 you can't do that. And now. <laughs> Now, bet this, bet that. We got our own site. We got our own analyst. And now the host is saying, yeah, it's, it's risk-free. Eh, it wasn't that risky, risk-free. Three more points, you lose. So, um, yeah, it's, um, it's, 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 it's a slippery slope. And I think we're just getting started. We've only been in this couple of years. Wait till, wait till something big breaks on this, and something very likely will. 
Uh, speaking of breaking, uh, it has not broken yet, but there's a Kent Bab story that's due to come out uh, on Kim Mulkey, the coach at uh, LSU. She used to coach uh, prior to that, uh, where was she? Louisiana Tech, I believe, and uh, played there, played at Louisiana Tech. Uh, great, great college coach, but a fiery woman. And um, there was a piece that Kent Babb did two years ago on Brian Kelly, who's the football coach at LSU. And he went to LSU from Notre Dame for a $100 million contract. And other than, you know, the, 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 the thought that there's a guy making with a $100 million contract in a very poor part of the country, there really wasn't anything salacious about it, anything that was, would be considered to be a, a, a criticism. It was just, you know, pointing out amongst poverty in that area, there's a man with, with great wealth to coach the football team. So Kim Mulkey has obviously gotten wind of what he's about to put out, and so she went on the offensive. She's criticizing a story that has not come out, threatening to sue about it, and went on a rant that went, what is this, um, Yeah, over three and a half minutes. So here we go. This was Kim Mulkey, the coach at LSU, all fired up before her team is about to play an NCAA tournament game about a story that may or may not be published in the Washington Post. This reporter has been working on a story about me for two years. After two years of trying to get me to sit with him for an interview, he contacts LSU on Tuesday as we were getting ready for the first round game of this tournament with more than a dozen questions, demanding a response by Thursday, right before we're scheduled to tip off. Are you kidding me? This was a ridiculous deadline that LSU and I could not possibly meet, and the reporter knew it. It was just an attempt to prevent me from commenting and an attempt to distract us from this tournament. It ain't gonna work, buddy. Unfortunately, this is part of a pattern that goes back years. I told this reporter two years ago that I didn't appreciate the hit job he wrote on Brian Kelly, and that's why I wasn't going to do an interview with him. After that, the reporter called two former college coaches of mine and left multiple messages that he was with me in Baton Rouge to get them to call him back. Trying to trick these coaches into believing that I was working with the Washington Post on a story. When my former coaches spoke to him and found out that I wasn't talking with the reporter, they were just distraught and they felt completely misled. Former players have told me that the Washington Post has contacted them and offered to let them be anonymous in a story if they'll say negative things about me. The Washington Post has called former disgruntled players to get negative quotes to include in their story. They're ignoring the 40 plus years of positive stories that, that people or they have heard from people about me. But you see reporters who give a megaphone to a one-sided embellished version of things aren't trying to tell the truth. They're trying to sell newspapers and feed the click machine. This is exactly why people don't trust journalists and the media anymore. It's these kinds of sleazy tactics and hatchet jobs that people are just tired of. I'm fed up and I'm not gonna let the Washington Post attack this university this awesome team of young women I have, or me without a fight. I've hired the best defamation law firm in the country, and I will sue the Washington Post if they publish a false story about me. Not many people are in a position to hold these kind of journalists accountable, but I am, and I'll do it. That's all I'm going to say about this right now. And now I'm going to get back to talking about my basketball team and winning this game 
tomorrow. And that was last night, which they did. They won easily. <laughs> I mean, this part about they've been trying to get me to talk for two years, and then they presented me with some questions just before we're about to leave for our trip, knowing it was a deadline I couldn't meet. Well, they've been trying to get you to talk for two years. You're not doing that. And like any good reporter, you get both sides. It's it's one sided so far because you haven't cooperated with The Washington Post and you're a public figure. And if you don't cooperate and they still have these accounts by, as she says, disgruntled players, they can you know use their name or not use their name. She's a public figure. They can, they can <laughs> the Post can do this. And the defamation Attorneys, yeah, they'll they'll take her money, but I I don't know if they'll necessarily take the case. And there's nothing, there's no case yet because there's no story. And Kent Babb has confirmed that he's working on a story about Kim Mulkey, but has not said anything else about it, and isn't going to say anything else about it. So she, she's something else. Um, there's a, a a certain ex president is looking for a running mate. Sounds like she might be a good choice. Hey. Coming up, uh, Dion Sanders talks about why he does not make in-home visits and if the draft were this year for his son, uh, his son who has another year to, to come back and play at Colorado, but if he were coming out in the draft, uh, Dion said there might be a problem with who drafts him. We'll get to that more as we continue. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630, the sports capital. Tony's coming up at 11 o'clock and in about uh, 20, 25 minutes, uh, Behind the scenes with the real Jake from State Farm. Uh, meantime, we move on with, uh, well, a little bit more college basketball. The uh, the women's tournament continues tonight, and uh, all eyes on Caitlin Clark, who plays her last game at the University of Iowa, second-round game against West Virginia, 8 o'clock tonight on ESPN. I saw this headline at SI.com, and my assumption is, you know, maybe there's gambling in the background. It says, referee removed from NCAA tournament game due to background conflict and this was a first round game where nc state beat chattanooga 64 45 referee tommy paris was removed from the game at halftime when it was discovered that she had received a master's degree from chattanooga (laughs) i mean i think that's that's really a stretch okay she got a master's degree from chattanooga so she's going to be biased i guess they do all they can to avoid that uh, Chattanooga coach Sean Poppy was surprised. She said um, they literally just got me in the locker room and said they were making a change. She said, I don't know what happened. I didn't see anything specific. Maybe the second time in my career that's happened, but the other one, there was an injury. So, you know, this one, I'm not really sure. She was talking about a, a rep that got hurt uh, during a game before. I mean, they they lost the game by 19 points. Um, <laughs> I mean, really, it, 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 I, I would believe that Chattanooga is being on a different level uh, that NC State, but um, I guess they had, had erred in checking on the background and they didn't want, you know, a game to, to come out and Chattanooga accused them of having a biased reference. No, of course, in this case, this would be the team that got clobbered. So I don't know. I, I don't know if they could really have a case on this, but uh, yeah, they made a mistake and at halftime, at halftime, they took her out. That doesn't make any sense. Deion Sanders getting his team ready for year two at the University of Colorado. He was on a podcast called Million Dollars Worth of Game. Um, And uh, he was talking about his son, Shador Sanders, who's the quarterback at Colorado, and cornerback slash receiver Travis Hunter, who is spectacular. I mean, I watched some of their games early in the season. Uh, There has not been a two-way player like this, maybe since Rod Woodson, and he may be better than Rod Woodson. Who knows? He got hurt, missed a lot of last season. But uh, he will be obviously a top pick in the draft. And... Dion said on the podcast, I know where I want them to go. He said, there are certain cities that fit, Atlanta fit, and I want that for my kids, all of them. I want the right fit. Atlanta was the first time I saw black people in positions of authority. It blew my mind. It was real in Atlanta. I'd never seen anything like that in my life. He also mentioned San Francisco, Dallas, Washington, and Baltimore as destinations. Well, he played for all four teams. Uh, but he also has said that he doesn't want Shador to play in cold weather cities. Well, he knows Baltimore and Washington are cold weather cities, and even in Dallas. I mean, I, I was in an ice storm there. It can get pretty cold. Uh, so he's going to do what Archie Manning did, he says, and, um, you know, make sure that Shador winds up with 
the right team. He's not coming out for the draft this year, but will be coming out next year. And this is what Dion said at his news conference the other day about where he expects him to go. Let's just get this straight. Let's get an elephant in the room. Shador would have been a high draft pick this year. Okay, let's just stop the foolishness and you get mad when I tell you. I'm the only reason I know that because don't you think I know people in the NFL? I'm sorry. Um, I played for how many years? 14. Um, got a gold jacket at the crib, I think. I think I know some people. You know the Jerry Jones, is that, you know, Arthur Blanks. Yeah, I know some people in the game. The Roger Goodells. You know, I know some people. So when I speak, I'm not just throwing stuff out of my head. I'm throwing stuff based on knowledge. So let's just get that straight. If Shador would have gone in the draft this year, he probably would have been the second. Uh, he wouldn't have been the first quarterback off the board. I think he had the ability, but he probably would have been the second quarterback off the board. Let's just get that straight. Well, I don't know, but uh, he's not. that's not an option for Washington. It hopefully won't be an option next year that they're good enough and, and they find somebody in this year's draft. Um, but he's, he's telling teams ahead of, a year ahead of time, uh, if you draft my son – uh, there's going to be an issue if I don't like the team that's that's taken him. And it's happened before. It happened with John Elway in 1983. His father didn't want him to go to Baltimore. They blamed the cold weather, and he said he wound up in Denver, which was ridiculous. Uh, the, the issue there was that he didn't want him to play for Frank Cush. Frank Cush was the coach of the Baltimore Colts at the time, and Jack Elway, John Elway's father, knew him. They had coached together in the same league. At, uh, at, at one time, Cush had been at Arizona State, and he decided that wasn't the right fit for his son, so they used baseball as leverage. John Elway was never going to play baseball, but he had been with the Yankees. He'd been taken by George Steinbrenner was playing in their minor leagues, and they said, eh, well, if I, I don't like where I'm, I'm drafted, I'm going to play baseball, and, uh, and, and it all worked out for him. They traded him to the Broncos. didn't work out for the Colts because they wound up moving a year later to Indianapolis. And Mel Kuyper is among those who says if, if John Elway would have landed in Baltimore, there's no way the Colts would have moved. Who knows? Uh, but that's how it all, all played out. Uh, we've had this before with Bo Jackson. I remember Bo Jackson, in his case, he was playing baseball at Auburn, having a great year, hitting like 500, bunch of home runs. And he, he was going to be the number one pick of the draft, which was held by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And he didn't have a problem going there. But the Buccaneers said, hey, we're going to take you number one. Uh, we need you to fly in for a physical. And we're going to send a private plane to Auburn to pick you up to bring you down to Tampa. And Bo says, he asked him, well, is that an NCAA violation? And they said, oh, no, no, we, we checked into it. It's perfectly fine. So he goes and he flies to Tampa, takes his physical, is back at Auburn getting ready for a baseball game, and his coach comes in and he says, "Uh, sorry, Bo, but your eligibility uh, is gone. uh, You you had a violation by taking a private plane to to Tampa for that physical. And Bo said, well, that's it. He said, I will never play for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. That's not going to happen. He was drafted by the Kansas City Royals, even though he had to start in the minors, much less money, had to ride the buses. He did it. And then a year later, Al Davis was shrewd enough to take him like in the fifth round and say, hey, you want to play football? And Bo said, yeah, I want to play football. I just wasn't going to play for Tampa because they lied to me. Went and played for the Raiders. Turned out to be a, a, a big picture mistake because he got hurt playing football and had to end both careers prematurely. But, you know, had he been not lied to by the Buccaneers, I don't know if he ever would have played baseball. I think it's, it's possible he would have been a, a Hall of Fame running back with the Buccaneers. You know, maybe the injury still happens. Who knows? Um, and he now says, Bo says, that if he had to do all over again, he'd never play pro football. He'd only play baseball. One of the great athletes who ever lived. So is Dion. Uh, more from Dion. And this starts out, this was, this was a question about the kind of players that he gets in his program. But it also addresses the way recruiting is done these days. You know, it used to be that if a coach wanted a top player, he'd make an in-home visit. He'd try mom's lasagna, tell her how great it was, schmooze with the family. You get the kid. Dion doesn't do in-home visits. And this is the long answer of, uh, of how that is and why that is. Everybody's not built for the moment. You got to understand that. Like, and shoot, we took the moment to the greatest heights. Like, it was like, shoot, and we plan on doing that again. But everybody's not built for that stage. That stage uh, comes with tremendous responsibility. 
and you got to get young men that are used to that and committed to that and want it and uh, relish that opportunity to be on that stage. And they're ready to grab that microphone and hit that note. I mean, you got to have those type of guys that I feel as though the goal is to get eight dogs on the side of the ball, seven or eight dogs that you know what you're going to get on a Saturday. And uh, we, we got some guys that I'm, 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 I'm happy about. Let me address something else that I think I need to address. I don't know who did it. I don't know if they're in here. If they are, you could just raise your hand like we, we did when we were in nursery and we said here. Um, There's an article that came out that said I don't go on visits. Okay. My approach, it's totally different than many coaches' approach. Um, um, sometimes I look, I'm a businessman as well, so I try to save our university money every darn chance I get. So for me to go to, let's just say I'm going to Florida and I'm visiting uh, whatever school, IMG. You don't think those coaches are going to be a little upset if I don't come by the school down the street? You, th you don't think it's going to be pandemonium if, if, <laughs> if or, uh, I'm going to get naysayed if I don't go another 45 minutes? Then if I go to that one, then I go, uh, well, I didn't come to that school. Now the coach is mad, so he's not going to let the kid come because he's mad because I chose that go to that school over that school. See, other coaches, they could do that, but I can't. I can't. And I've really pretty much done a personal survey. I really, truly, in all my heart, believe that parents don't want me at their house. They want to come see my house. They want to see how I live, how I get down. They want to see what I got going on, what God has done in my life. I know when I was in college, I did not want Bobby Bowden in my house because I knew at the 7 o'clock it was going to be rats and roaches on parade doing their thing. <laughs> so that, that was just straight up, honestly. I didn't. So uh, that never transpired. That never happened for me. And we target um, mostly guys that's in the portal. When do you make visits to portal guys' homes? Anybody do that? Do they do that? I, I don't do it. Anybody? Have you guys heard of that? I don't. I think when a guy is in his 20s and he has one and two more shots, he don't give a darn about the picture. He don't give a darn about the parade that you want to take him on. He wants to know, okay, how are you going to use me? How can you help me get to the league? And what am I going to get paid? That's it. That's the world we live in now. It, I, don't, I have never heard one guy say, I chose this college because this coach came by my crib. Have you? It's different now. The parents, I love them, and I want to show them bolder. I want them to see this and how beautiful it is and why I'm so eager and how much I love this city and this, this state and this team. I want them to see that because guess what? That's where the kid is coming. The kid coming here. Going there is just showcase for me. That's just blowing money. It's blowing a bag. Don't make sense. And I can't do the things other coaches can do. You know why? I'm Coach Prime. And I didn't stutter when I said it. <laughs> <laughs> he is one of the all-time characters. I, I, I find it funny that he's now fiscally responsible. That's, that's funny with his kid driving a, a Rolls Royce, which got booted on the campus. Uh, he, he does not seem to be a thrifty person, let's put it that way. Uh, but he has brought in a lot of money to the school. Uh, it is... You know, they only won four games last year, so let's not get carried away. Some people are calling him you know, one of the greatest coaches of all time. Please, you know, let's let's see him win some some games first. Uh, but he has brought great attention to the school. Uh, he knows, boy, he knows how to have the he, – he has the parade come to him. He doesn't go to the parade, and that's what he's saying there about, you know, making the in-home visits. And, and he's probably right about the transfer portal. By the time a player is ready to change colleges, he knows the scene. He knows how it's done. It's not – you know, he's, he's used to the recruiting part process, so having Coach Deion Sanders come to his house probably, meh, I don't know. I don't know how big of a deal that is, but he's saying, yeah, it makes news when he comes into town, so there's that. Um, and as far as, you know, how great it is in Boulder, and you know, don't, don't take him at his word that he's, he's there for life. He was saying that about Jackson State, and he took the next opportunity, and it's going to be interesting to me 
to see what happens after this year. And I assume he's going to have a team that's at least competitive enough to be in a bowl game. And I assume that his son Shador is going to be one of the top players taken in the draft next year. Does he go with Shador? Does he try to make that a package deal? Because if he's going to be one of the top few picks in the draft, it's probably a team that's changed coaches. You know, that's that's the way it, it works. If you're bad enough to be at the top of the draft, you had a bad enough year to get your coach fired. And does Dion go in a package deal? And is he talking to Jerry Jones about that? Because he, as, as we, we played the, the uh, comment earlier, he's already talking about, you know, manipulating things so that Shador doesn't go where Shador or he doesn't want Shador to go. And he mentioned the four teams that he played for, San Francisco, Dallas, Washington, and Baltimore, as places he might go, you know. Uh, now, Baltimore, unless they have a, a terrible year under John Harbaugh, they're not changing coaches. Uh, Washington just hired Dan Quinn, so I don't think that's that's going to happen. Uh, Balt, uh, Dallas, yeah, that that could be that could that's conceivable. And uh, no, you're not going to see uh, Kyle Shanahan fired in San Francisco, even if they have a down year after just making the Super Bowl. So. You know, does does he go and, and and with him to Dallas? It would seem to be a, a perfect fit. Jerry Jones, Deion Sanders, and Deion's son. You know, is is he is he moving in that direction? So you know, this this selling of Boulder. He's great at that. He's a great salesman. He's a great showman. He's a smart guy. He knows how to play the game. No question about it. But you always got to take these things with a grain of salt. And uh, and what what he'll say next year when he does something that he says he's not going to do this year. That's, uh, that's something to keep an eye on. Coming up, Larry David. He's got two shows to go for Curb Your Enthusiasm. Didn't see last night's episode. Planned to watch it today, but he was on the Rich Eisen show uh, Friday. Yeah, I guess it was Friday or maybe Thursday. Um, talking about his favorite episodes as the incredible t- series winds down. We'll get to that more as we continue. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630, the sports capital. All right, Tony's coming up at 11 o'clock today. Bunch of stuff in the 10 o'clock hour, including Deion Sanders on why he does not do in-home visits. He's also, he's not even threatening. He's telling people that next year when his son Shador comes out for the NFL draft, that he's going to pull a Manning. He's going to make sure that Shador doesn't go to a team that he doesn't want to go to. And, uh... Dion says, who knows if this is true or not, but he says if Shador had come out this year, uh, and he's eligible, he's been in college for three years, if if he'd come out this year, that he'd be the number two pick of the draft, which might mean here. (laughs) And does he want to come here? Eh, I don't know, but hopefully that becomes a moot point for next year. Let's let's hope that the commanders are not picking second and uh, and needing to pick a quarterback, but you never know. You never know how that goes. Uh, you probably heard over the weekend that Peter Angelos died at the age of 94. Interesting, the timing of the sale. I think it was somewhat in, in anticipation of this, um, and there's some tax implications that go along with, uh, with ownership change when a, a person is deceased, and Peter Angelos had been out of the spotlight for a long time. It said in the obit that he'd suffered a stroke in 2018, and uh, I don't think anybody's seen him publicly, maybe close to 10 years, something like that. But uh, the, the David Rubenstein group now uh, will own the team. They move forward with that. And uh, Peter Angelos uh, had a life that was, well, it was very controversial, especially here, because the obituary was on the front page, A1, yesterday's post. And the subheadline said, help to keep baseball out of Washington. You know, that's that tells you right there that he's a, a, a lightning rod of a person and um, and was. I mean, he he was, you know, the, there's like great, great contradictions in his life. Like, for example, uh, when they wanted to keep Mike Mussina when he became a free agent, eighty eight and a half million dollars was what the Yankees offered him over six years. That was after the uh, 2000 season. Angelos didn't want to pay that money. But. Remember when we had the strike of 1994, the players' strike, which spilled over into 1995, and teams were going to go the route that the NFL went in 1987, fielding scab teams, he wouldn't do it. Uh, He said, forget it, we're not going to do that. And that created friction with the other owners, and 
you know, one thing led to another. I think it was Judge uh, Sonia Sotomayor who, who ruled in court that it was unconstitutional to have these scab teams, and that's what led to baseball coming back. But uh, that, that didn't uh, curry any favor with the owners. He said no replacement players or pickup teams are going to be wearing uh, Orioles uniforms, and they did not. Uh, and, you know, if baseball would have resumed, Cal Ripken wasn't going to cross the picket line anyway, but if they would have resumed with those scab players, that would have ended the streak. Um, and he, of course, got the streak later that year, 1995, when they came back in September of 95. He broke uh, Lou Gehrig's record. He bought the team in 1993. And there have been some stories written like he saved baseball ball. No, he didn't. He bought a team that was moving into a gem of a stadium. They, were, they had just built Camden Yards by the time he took over 1993, put up $40 million of his own money. They just sold for $1.7 billion. He had some well-known partners, including Tom Clancy, Barry Levinson, who wrote you know great movies like Rain Man and Diner and uh, tennis star Pam Shriver. Um, and, uh, you know, they didn't have a, an empty seat for the first few years. And he also had the Washington market. And I've referenced this a number of times when Camden Yards opened in 1992, Tony Kornheiser went to the first game and he said, forget baseball in Washington. That's not happening. He said, this is a great stadium. It's easy to get to easy to get in and out of. And this is going to be Washington's baseball team. Fortunately, 13 years later, he proved to be wrong. But that was how good it was, and that's how much control that the Orioles had in D.C. They had a downtown ticket office. Um, The papers, the the Times and the Post both had a beat writer for the team. Tom Boswell did it for a while. I forget who who followed him. Um, They had special trains from Union Station that went directly to Camden Yards. This was was Washington's team. And, um, And then, you know, Things happened, and he got the Masson rights, which has created a lot of friction with Washington as well. But I, I believe that, you know, here was 93. We were only without baseball. It was a while. It was 22 years. But we had to wait another 12 years for it to happen. And there was a couple of rounds of expansion that we missed out on. Um, there, was, uh, there was the time when the Astros were going to move here. That didn't happen. You know, things like that. And Angelos probably played a role in that because they were afraid of him suing. That's how he made his money. Uh, asbestos victims. He uh, he had a lawsuit that uh, he collected three hundred million dollars on, uh, and it was a billion dollar suit uh, representing people who had had lung damage from uh, asbestos. Um, some other quirky things about him: he wanted to stop Orioles uh, top personnel from dri- uh, wanted them to drive American made cars. Ordered Johnny Oates, who was the manager, to get rid of his Toyota. Uh, he bickered with Davey Johnson, who took the Orioles to the playoffs in both of his two years as a manager at the end of the 97 season. Johnson resigned on the day he was named American League Manager of the Year. And then uh, they went 13 straight losing seasons before Buck Showalter uh, took over in 2010 and they started to win again. So, you know, he had a he had a, 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 a roller coaster tenure uh, and, a, and a life of. Uh, you know, someone who was self-made, grew up uh, tough, tough in Baltimore, was an amateur boxer, five foot six, maybe had a little bit of a short man's complex, but uh, but built a built an empire that was able to to buy a team that sold for close to two billion dollars, about ten times what he had paid for the team. All right, uh, Larry David makes uh, eh, I don't want to say frequent appearances, but goes on the Rich Eisen show from time to time. And I thought, hmm, what's the connection there? Is he how is he friends with Rich Eisen? How does that work? I don't. I, I know Rich does well, but does he travel in the same circles as Larry David? I and mean, how are they friends? Well, it turns out that that Eisen is on a panel of people that screens the shows. Like before they put them on HBO, they show it to I guess they call it a focus group, and Eisen is part of that. And they want to know, do they get the jokes? You know, how do they respond to certain things? And if it's a dud, they're not going to put it on the air. So I guess there's some quid pro quo there. And because Rich participates in this panel, Larry goes on the show. So with two episodes to go, didn't see last night, hope to watch that tonight. But two episodes after last night, uh, Larry David is now closing up shop. There will be no more Curb Your Enthusiasms after, after the next two shows. And uh, and he and he when he's on the show they do this um, they they want Larry to you know be in a situation that Larry on Curb would be in so this is one that was presented to him by Eisen. You're at a restaurant and you are on time for your reservation and you've been told your table will be ready 
once the people who are currently occupying it are done paying the bill, but they linger. Is it appropriate for you to approach the table and tell people to hurry it up? It's appropriate on Curb Your Enthusiasm. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm sorry I never did it, because it's a great idea. I would have done that. If you told me that at the beginning of the season, I would have put that in. Because that's something TV Larry would do? Yeah, TV Larry would do that in a second. But real life? Real Larry can't do that, yeah. Because after a while, though, you could see the people just lingering and sitting it's, there, and they haven't ordered a thing in a forever. It's unbelievably inconsiderate. When you're done and you see people are still waiting for a table. Yes. I mean, if you have a late reservation, like 7.30, mm-hmm. and, you're pa- and you're going into 9 o'clock, you, you look around, you see the tables are empty, no, nobody's waiting. Yes. But if you're there at like 6 o'clock, and now it's 7 o'clock and people are waiting, and they're looking at you... <laughs> And you're sipping coffee? Get out of here. Get out of that table. You're being rude. So you do make eye contact. Is that's that's the most you 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 communicate with this I might table? Do this. You're at the table. Yes. I'm waiting. Yeah. I might look at you and go. <laughs> sort of like a get out, you know. Yeah, come on. Give me a break. Come look on. At the, look yeah. at the watch, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Look at no, the look at the watch. Yeah. I mean that it's gotta be more aggressive than yeah. that. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's it, though. That's but it. in Curb, Larry would in walk curb, up. I'm walking over to the table. Yes. Excuse me. <laughs> you finished your meal 25 minutes ago. You see us waiting here. Come on. This is not right. It's not right. What are you doing? Yeah. I, I don't know how that episode was never written. That's perfect. Yeah. That's, that's a perfect Curb Your Enthusiasm. Never did that. And uh, as the interview wrapped up, and they went about 40 minutes, um, as it wrapped up, Eisen said, well, with two shows, well, when they did the interview, it was three shows to go. What's your favorite Curb Your Enthusiasm? I love the uh, ski lift episode. <laughs> with the Orthodox Jewish woman? Yeah, when I had to act very kind of Jewy, mm-hmm. and, um, and Susie pretended to be my wife. Mm-hmm. And she wanted me to jump off the ski lift because she couldn't be with a man Mm -hmm. alone after sundown. Um, I love that one. Uh, Palestinian chicken. Oh, my. Yeah. Gosh. I love the uh, the Bill Buckner episode. Oh, yeah. Which you had to really work to get him, right? Like you really had to work to get him? A couple of phone calls. Okay. Yeah. I wanted him to drop the baby in the first episode. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he goes to catch the baby oh he even kills the baby <laughs> i couldn't do it though couldn't do it oh did you actually ask him to do that no or you never no, did? no 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 okay. no no but i thought of it yeah. <laughs> i thought it would be oh boy this is like really sick funny right yeah. but no 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 you, you just can't do that and if, if bill buckner was presented with that I think people who were advising him would have said, no, don't do that. That's that's not going to work. But it's a, it's a tremendous show. It's been going on for almost 25 years. Hard to imagine that. First show was in 2000. Um, some of the people who have been on it over the years, hysterically funny, uh, have passed away, including Bill Buckner. But Larry, you know, he makes it work. And, you know, what you hear is that they do a lot of improv on that show like they have an outline of where they want to go but there's no script and so that's why it's so real and genuine they use their own names all that and uh you know larry david who was uh, you know 2000 you knew he had produced seinfeld you knew that that was that was on his his credits and that's why he had all that money to live in los angeles and and kind of tweak the the way things are in in brentwood and and that area but you, you really didn't know him. He had been on a couple of episodes of Seinfeld. He played Steinbrenner, you know, Big George, you know. And, um, and now we got to know him over the last 25 years, and we got to know why, why Seinfeld works so well. He's a University of Maryland guy. You know, he, uh, he grew up in New York, and um, I think he was, uh, was, was Brooklyn or the Bronx. And uh, I don't think his family moved to um, – they may have moved to Long Island at, at one point and then uh, and then came to Maryland and is still still friends with uh, people that went to school there and has used some of their names in uh, in some of the shows. And, uh, you know, after Seinfeld, because Seinfeld ended, it's hard, hard to imagine this, Seinfeld ended, I think, like 95, 
So, you know, it's almost 30 years since the end of Seinfeld, and there was like this gap, and here comes Larry David with a show that's, you know, it's not going to be seen by as many people. It's on HBO. It's not on NBC. But we we now have a, another character who we gravitate to, some of us, and and as successful as Seinfeld was, I don't want to say that Larry David and Curb Your Enthusiasm outran it, but it, it's got a following, and it's got a following because, well, he, he says things that I guess a lot of people think but don't really want to go there, and he's willing to go there, and he makes it work, and it's, it's you know, you, you watch it, it's 40 minutes now, whatever the show's length is, and you and you have to laugh. It's it's funny, and I'm gonna miss it. I'm gonna miss it. But uh, there's been some big gaps too, in uh, in years between shows, and uh, I guess the last one is just a couple of weeks away. Anyway, that's a wrap for me. Tony's coming up next. I'll see you tomorrow at 9 a.m.